Hi, Jamie. Good to talk to you. Hi, Jamie. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, this conversation could be uh, tricky with two Jamies, but I'm sure people will be able to follow it. So, well, well it's I great. Don't to, uh, I don't tend to refer to myself in the third person, so I think that'll be all right. Yeah, we should be okay. We should be okay. <laughs> um, so we've 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 spoken a number of times online before, and but this is the first time we've had a chance to have a proper conversation. So it's great that you've been able to make the time to talk to me. And in these series of what I'm calling sentientist conversations, they're conversations really with a very diverse range of people about their philosophical journey around the two most important questions in philosophy, at least to my mind. So we talk about what's real and what matters. And the idea of sentientism, as you well know, is that it's a very simple pluralistic philosophy that says when we're thinking about what's real, we should use a naturalistic approach that uses evidence and reason in all of its forms to form provisional and probabilistic beliefs, always being open-minded and ready for new evidence to shift our priors and shift our beliefs. And when it comes to what matters, the clue is in the name sentientism, that we should use sentience, again, judged naturalistically to set our moral circle or whatever moral polygon we want to we want to use to define what matters to us morally. So really, that's the context. But before we get into your view on how to answer those two questions, it would be good if you could just introduce yourself briefly and uh, explain your your life and work. Yeah, great. Thanks. So I am a researcher at two different organizations. One is Sentience Institute, which is an organization I've been working at for about two and a half years now. And we are a social science think tank, basically. We research into social change and the kind of mechanisms that cause that, the kind of cause and effect going on in social change. And with a particular interest focusing on this topic of moral circle expansion and essentially kind of digging into the evidence into again, what's going on in those kind of cause and effect relationships and being able to kind of pull those levers and think about how we can most effectively encourage moral circle expansion. And this idea of moral circle expansion then is, well, when, when, to, when we talk about the moral circle, we're talking about the set of beings that are included in social norms and society's laws and people's kind of general moral consideration and that sort of thing. I guess our kind of goal is for there to be the right kind of beings to be sufficiently considered within the moral circle, essentially, whatever that exactly that might mean. Uh, but the assumption being that it's insufficiently wide at the moment that beings aren't sufficiently included in the moral circle. Mm. So that's a kind of real brief summary, and we can kind of dig into particular bits if you like. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, highly relevant to the topics yeah. today, so it fits well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as as you say, I think there's a, a lot of overlap, even as just as you as you explain those two kind of core goals of of sentientism in general just now, um, right down to the name. <laughs> there's a lot of similarity <laughs> between the interests and the goals of Sentience Institute, uh, including that kind of basing the key criterion that we focus on is is sentience in terms of at least I guess how we think about it as research in terms of what that moral circle should be. But I guess because it's a you know it's a small group and it's a new group. Uh, we don't have, I don't think we have particularly, we haven't really committed to kind of fixed, this is what Sentence Institute believes and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of scope for kind of variation in some of those things. But certainly in terms of the the kind of the, the researchers that we've had to date, that's definitely been a bit of a focus. So just to kind of, just to kind of summarize some of the stuff that I do, as I say, I'm a researcher there. I do a bunch of kind of, despite the way that we're talking about it now, we don't tend to kind of spend that much time on these kind of the the kind of overarching justification for our views that much we do some quite concrete empirical research into kind of because they're obviously right <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> yes. there's obviously a bunch of different ways you could think about what would be most useful for encouraging the kinds of changes we're we're hoping to encourage um it's partially a thing about comparative advantage and what our skill sets are and that sort of thing um but certainly our work is essentially about building the the evidence base for what the most effective strategies will be for encouraging the change we want to see so i do a bunch of that kind of quite applied research i also host a, a podcast at centers institute where we have 12 episodes so far i might be getting the number slightly wrong but they're it's quite similar to this podcast fairly lengthy kind of more than an hour type conversations um quite in depth about the work people have been doing um so that's researchers advocates sometimes entrepreneurs stuff like that yeah it's fascinating i'd encourage everybody to subscribe so <laughs> <laughs> thanks appreciate that uh, and i should also say that i also work 
at another organization. I guess I led with that partly because I've been there longer, partly because it's more obviously relevant to uh, the interests of sentientism per se. But I also work at another nonprofit, which I co-founded late last year called Animal Advocacy Careers. And my title there is also a researcher, but I do a bit, of, a bit of a jack of all trades in the sense that it's much smaller. It's not a research nonprofit per se. And we do kind of a bunch of different things where, and obviously this is a bit more applied even than the, the kind of the Census Institute research where it's kind of working out what movement advocates should be doing, that sort of thing. And actually careers is a lot more thinking about, well, I was going to say individuals, but we have kind of several different audiences. One is partly what individuals can do with their time in order to, we always frame things about helping animals the most and helping animals most effectively. Yeah. But obviously my motivation is partly thinking about other kinds of sentient beings in, in part of that and uh, a general progression of the moral circle. Um, so yeah, we're th helping individuals think about how they can use their time. We also kind of work with animal advocacy nonprofits to help them achieve their goals and kind of address bottlenecks that they might be facing so yeah we have a bunch of different audiences and we're kind of working out at the moment exactly where our niche is going to be because as i say it's very early days we've only been around for about a year um, and well i think we'll come back to many of those themes particularly towards the end of the conversation when we start to talk about the future and how we can make the world a better place but it would be good to wind the clock back and i guess follow your own personal philosophical journey such as you've had one around those two central topics so the first one being what's real and where that starts for many people is whether they grew up in a religious environment at home originally or whether they grew up in an atheist or a naturalistic household you know how's their epistemology developed over time and you know and in short where are they now so it'd be great to know that that story if you don't mind sharing it yeah sure my family was certainly not religious. I, I guess one side of my family kind of agnostic slash weekly Christian, but yeah. I, I guess very private about it. It was almost kind of like, maybe this is a thing, <laughs> but yeah. Not, yeah. you know, I certainly didn't ever catch my family praying or anything like that. Um, yeah. Other side of the family, very, uh, at least certain members of it, very sort of forthrightly atheist and skeptical. And yeah. Uh, so for context, my grandfather was a, was a, as an engineer, and did lots of kind and did kind of like computer coding and stuff like that. And my mum is a research scientist, and so there's this very scientific kind of stream. And they've they've never been, <laughs> at least within the the people that I know on that side of the family, have never been at all religious. So yeah, yeah, certainly in terms of my my background, I've never had. When you come from that background, there's there's very little incentive or reason to suddenly adopt a faith, right? Like I, in, unless you're kind of raised in a certain environment you know why would i suddenly there's all these different religions <laughs> yeah <laughs> what what would cause me to think oh that one's the correct one or anything like that and it's, it's it's interesting but i think there's something in what you say that in that for many of the people i've talked to for this series so far they started in a you know a religious or a supernatural worldview just assumed and as a default and really given to them by parents and then reinforced by society and priests and others around them. And then it was a process of often, you know, teenage exploration and finding yourself as an individual that led them to, a, you know, a more naturalistic worldview and to let that stuff go. And it does seem reasonably rare. It's not impossible and it does happen, but it seems reasonably rare that process of exploration leads people to a supernatural worldview and i think you hinted at part of the reason why is there's just so many to choose from so when you when you start exploring you almost think well where, you know where would i go next but it but it does happen some people do still find you know a particular affinity they're drawn to something or they they meet a group or a particular person that draws them into a particular remit but yeah it does seem that the flow is is, is pretty one way but some people you know for some people it, it's part of developing individuality teenage years that sort of process of kicking back and and rebelling against family as well. Were there any points at which you were sort of tempted, if not by a religious worldview, maybe some of the other supernatural stuff, you know, any sort of woo or mysticism or spirituality or, you know, products that Gwyneth Paltrow sells or old tennis <laughs> medicine or <laughs> have uh, you dabbled in any of that? No. It's frankly, been a hard naturalistic all the way through. Yeah, I don't know. Nothing's, like you say, nothing's ever tempted me really to the extent that uh, I think like, have excessive skepticism to things that are even you know potentially scientific but have that association like mindfulness and meditation <laughs> and yeah, yeah. That kind of just yeah. like it, it probably takes more to convince me that they're that they're worthwhile than it should <laughs> yes and it's, it is really a tricky balance because one of the dangers of a naturalistic worldview is because you can become so focused on the evidence and a reasoning process that it can feel 
like you've got the answers and everybody else can go away. And that's that's the end of a naturalistic or scientific worldview. You need to, despite the confidence the evidence might give you, still retain an open mind. But the trick in, in my mind is, fine, we've got to be radically open minded, even to things that might sound crazy. And, you know, a lot of good science has come from crazy ideas. But you still withhold belief until the evidence is there. And that's the bit that many people, I think, struggle with they they're open-minded and then get some sort of romantic or emotional attachment to something for which the evidence isn't there and may never be there but it's a yeah it's a tricky balance but uh, yeah if anything i'd rather go on the more skeptical side yeah i mean obviously the, you have to ensure that you have well take precautions to reduce the chance that your beliefs become a kind of tribalistic identity regardless of yeah. the direction and regardless of i, I guess people kind of sometimes you might have gone through a particular journey of changing your mind about certain key beliefs and then you form these heuristics which underpin this certain beliefs that don't necessarily follow or, or beliefs and then you kind of build up your identity and defensiveness around them and then any kind of threat to that is uh, is difficult to cope with and and kind of yeah so, so I, can, I can definitely imagine that you know i'm sure we're all guilty of that to some extent it's just yeah. like human psychology right yeah absolutely it's just unavoidable and, and being aware of that i guess is part of the part of the defense um, and but I think there is something there that a lot of uh, you talked about the sort of militant atheist or the more skeptical or the scientific community can c sometimes come across as quite arrogant and a little over assertive. And I think, a, a, you know, a dose more humility might help to, um, you know, might help us get our message across, but also help us to do what science is about, which is self-correct and get less wrong. And as soon as you let something form your own dogma and you become over committed to it, you know, you you find that process very hard. So, One interesting reason why many people are hesitant about moving away from a religious or a supernatural worldview is, is actually because of that link to the second part of our conversation about morals and morality. So some people will feel that there's a sort of an objective reassurance over having some perfect deity that defines goodness that will judge you. And they're worried that without that, there is no morality. I mean, you, you clearly don't have that. You seem like a nice guy. You're not out raping and pillaging and murdering, uh, despite your lack of a belief in God. But um, it would be interesting to know how that side of your thinking has evolved. You know, what? how would you describe the base of your morality, the root of your morality, the grounding of your mor morality, if it has one? And again, how's that changed from an early, early stage, both in what's what matters to you morally, but also, as you've hinted at in your work, how you've drawn your moral circle and has that shifted over time? And does that differ from the way you, you grew up? So for me, my family, certainly despite not having kind of over, you know, emphasis on religion or even believing at all, I guess there's always been, in the way I was brought up, was always a sense of caringness and obligations to some extent to others yeah. and obligations to society and a kind of sense of, of duty. And you, you kind of strive, you be conscientious because that's what good people do type thing. And I guess yeah. I, we could kind of unpick where that comes from, but um Certainly, you know, my family, uh, if almost everybody in my family is kind of socially conservative, but in a kind of one nation Tory kind of way of kind yeah. of like care for others. Um, that's always been a that's always been the environment I grew up in. And yeah. I mentioned my granddad, the engineer. He's always he was always like a very kind of very involved in lots of different charitable stuff and in in the local community rather than kind of international charities. But I've always had that background that it's always been a, a, a good thing to to strive for, I guess. So I've had that. The interest in animals, I, I find hard to explain because yeah. uh, this was not, my family were never vegetarian or anything like that. I actually do have an uncle who's who's vegetarian, but I, th I think I think at least that's mostly for kind of health reasons. When I was <laughs> like sort of four or five years old, um, just became increasingly reluctant to eat meat and increasingly associated it with with animals and um, at one point uh, that's pretty early yeah i don't I, I mean obviously i don't remember the exact details but i remember it as one day coming into the kitchen and seeing my mum cutting up a chicken and seeing that it looked like a chicken and just bursting into tears and refusing to eat it but according to my family i've been kind of increasingly pushing meat to the side of my plate and like that sort of thing so yeah i don't know how that happened but it did <laughs> And this, I, that's a fascinating story because one of the things I, the, a theme that's come through these conversations is both on the naturalism and that sort of natural basic compassion that goes beyond the human species. It seems something that's quite common in very young children. And it's a bit self serving to say, and I don't want to pretend that, you know, two and three year olds are perfect ethical beings and 
you know, and then they are corrupted by society. But at least in some sense, you know, very young children are like miniature scientists themselves, right? They're exploring the world, they're using their senses, they're building evidence and reason to try and understand stuff. I'm not saying that's naturalism, but it's it sort of is in a very basic way. But I think most very young kids have that same sort of base level of compassion that's quite broad as well. And that, yes, there are some little kids that will pull the wings off flies. But generally, you know, if you put a toddler with a pot-bellied pig, for example, it, it won't want to harm it. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. That you, it almost feels like you sort of held on to that natural sentiocentric, that broad compassion throughout. Whereas for most people, it's trained out of us just because there's a relentless message almost from birth that, you know, consuming animal products is completely normal. And, and in some cases, believing religious or supernatural beliefs are normal as well. So it's almost like you start from one place and then family and teachers and society and priests and others sort of teach you a bunch of other stuff and draw you away from that. And then later in life, people almost revert but it sounds like on the animal ethic side you, you almost n never never left it and just held on to it from from the start i don't know if that yeah maybe i guess i i've heard this kind of idea before that people that people start off kind of naturally almost like altruistic or considering of animals and i think it's a nice narrative for uh, like animal advocacy yeah. to be able to push i'm not sure i find it convincing just intuitively i think you can kind of counterbalance that tendency to to explore and, and support animals with also uh, you know, children crushing bugs for fun and things yeah. like this. Well, it yeah. doesn't seem obvious to me that it's one way or the other. It's more just kind of like not not very inculcated into society's norms yet, whatever kind of bizarre combination of beliefs that might be, that are society's norms, um, mm. children uh, ignoring them in, in, in every direction, if that makes sense. I'm sure yeah. there, has, there, must have been, there must be some kind of psychological research into this. Like there's a whole field of... Um, developmental psychology and certainly there are some researchers who are very interested in, in moral self expansion who have kind of gone down that route and there are a bunch of studies about just the breadth of moral circles that are conducted specifically with children i can't think off the top of my head at least if there have been any that explicitly compare kind of the same questions between mm. children and adults which would which would tell us something about that but i'm sure if if not yeah. in terms like moral circles per se i imagine i mean there's quite a lot of stuff relating to kind of attitudes to animals and animal product consumption and stuff i'm sure there's been some studies doing that sort of thing somewhere yeah yeah no it's fascinating and you're right it was it's, it's dangerous to be too naive about that stuff and my <laughs> gut my gut feel is that i think young kids um, while they might see insects or other types of animals that feel very different to us mm -hmm. um more as objects of objects to to play with right they don't necessarily intuitively have the same level of compassion maybe for you know mammals and some of the more you know animals that are closer to us in the evolutionary tree or behavior you seem like there's more of an analog and you can make eye contact and you can and engage with them directly there's maybe, maybe there is a more natural compassion at that level but yeah it certainly doesn't apply for consistently for some of the simpler yeah. animals yeah. yeah that sounds plausible certainly like closeness to to humanity seems like a a, a key driver of the extent of, of moral circles some of the research i've been looking at in in the kind of empirical research for example there's a, there's a bunch of papers that basically what they do is they ask about responses to different entities you can you could kind of look at that and get an impression that the the less human seeming things tend to be granted yeah. like less patienthood whether that's specifically because of that or because of something else is not necessarily clear but certainly i can that's the key driver um this kind of anthropomorphism idea it seems plausible that that could be an especially important kind of predictor of concern for children as opposed to adults. But yeah, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to kind of jump the gun and more, more uh, research required. Yeah, yeah. Well, or, or if possibly more research required, possibly just my knowledge and memory of it is. <laughs> is <interesting. laughs> yeah, more papers to read, if not more research required. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it seems like your moral circle, at least conceptually, way before you knew the term sentience, was drawn roughly delimited by sentience. And I guess, given the you know the focus of your work, that's where you are now, that you see sentience as the prime characteristic for moral considerability. I couldn't tell you exactly why. I mean, partly this is just because I have a terrible memory, um, but I couldn't tell you exactly what my drivers were before. But I'm not sure it was necessarily sentence per se I mm. and like certainly intuitively that makes sense but I do think kind of anthropomorphism was a key driver for me and I do think yeah. I mean obviously I wouldn't justify explicitly in those terms because it doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I do think that despite 
occasionally feeling like I'm kind of quite emotionally disconnected from a lot of the stuff I work on. I also feel that I am quite, I, I think I'm slightly more prone than others to that anthropomorphism bias. For example, the kind of researcher and blogger, Brian Tomasic, who now, who mm. is co-founder of the organization Center on Long-Term Risk, he has a paper somewhere, and I couldn't tell you which one it was in, it's a video of bacteria being killed by, um, it's like salt being fired at them or something, but you can see it's under a microscope. You know, if you ask me, do I assign any moral value to bacteria? I would have said nope, or like yeah. so negligible that even absurdly large numbers would would count for less than like any animal type thing or something yeah. like that. But I'm watching that and I was like, that's really sad. <laughs> and just watching this video because it looks like bugs being killed, and it looks yeah. like. So I do think, yeah, I do think that. So for me, that's that was probably a, a driver. Um, that was a bit of a detail. But it, it, no, yeah, it was, but it's an interesting detail because the question was, you know technically do you do you set the boundary of moral vulnerability oh, right. based on sentience so certainly i do now to the extent that i think other people think i'm a little bit odd for not incorporating other things at all sometimes i think a lot of people will think of sentience as a relevant criterion but then include other things as well like some of the ethical philosophical papers i've been reading for this research i've been doing into the moral consideration of artificial entities there, there'll be there are some people who say Sentience is important, but then it's their interests that matter and interests might be affected by autonomy or something else as well as sentience mm. per se. So I do think that there's like, and those, you know, those are professional <laughs> ethicists. Yeah. Um, but I think also, you know, people just intuitively, it, it'll be kind of like, yeah, the ability to feel pain or pleasure, whatever matters, but then these other things kind of matter to some extent as well. And they might justify in different ways. But I think I'm just kind of like, at least now, having at least with the stuff I've read and the way I've thought about things, my intuition is just like, yeah, the capacity for pain or pleasure, you know, good or po positive or negative experiences is what matters. And anything else just seems kind of is only instrumentally valuable in, yes. yeah. in the sense that it, it might give us information about what matters to that entity. But the only thing that does matter is its experience of you know, those positive or negative feelings, basically. And I can trace that back quite clearly in terms of where my views crystallised on these things to having read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. When I was a teenager, I'd been kind of, obviously by this point, vegetarian for over a decade. I don't know, it'd kind of been always a thing that I, I kind of thought of it as like a morally important thing, but I, I, I couldn't necessarily articulate that well why I just kind of like animals matter, blah, blah, blah. My friend bought me this book and he was quite interested in philosophy. And he bought me this book and I kind of remember, he bought it for my birthday and I remember thinking, oh, thanks, <laughs> like a great philosophical tome. Um, <laughs> but I did read it. And from that point on, it was kind of, philosophy is kind of, it's not my forte. So I do worry that I haven't kind of exposed myself to enough contradictory lines of thought, whatever. But it's matched so closely <laughs> with my intuitions, I felt at least, or at least was a much better articulation of some intuitions that I had that I kind of almost adopted wholesale people think of you. <laughs> you just um, jumped on them. They're great coattails to jump on though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, subsequent things, I like I say, my intuitions are so closely aligned with, with sentience being a key, key criteria. And like I, I read other things and I'm just kind of, but how does this fit into... So it's almost, it's all, I do worry that it's almost like what I was saying before about where I kind of adept, adopted this identity where it's like, this is what matters. Anything else is a challenge which is to be rebutted. But I, I don't think I have that attitude intentionally. And I've certainly occasionally sought out things which, which disagree with yeah. my kind of consequentialist moral framework that I have. I'm, I tried to read through a book specifically on kind of utilitarianism for and against and remember finding it <laughs> bewildering and and didn't change. Did, I, I kind of had this intuition that sometimes I quite often read philosophy and ethics stuff, and I feel that I either agree with it intuitively or it does nothing to change my mind. So I haven't kind yeah. of pursued it much further, partly because of that. But yes, yeah, as I said, it's not my fault. And there's there's a real danger we disagree too much because I think you're right because the reason you don't explore it any further is because you've already got the right answer and that's the end of it. But I, I mean, I share that intuition that from the reading I've done, and I'm very much an amateur in this field, is that almost tautologically, all moral value ultimately comes back to the qualitative experiences of sentient beings. And I've, and I've had this conversation with people a number of times. I've just said, try and explain to me any morally good or morally bad outcome without referring to how it affects 
the experience of a sentient being. And I've never found anyone who can do it because everything they mention always is because of its impact on a sentient being. So, you know, one of the massive criticisms of Singer and, you know, sentiocentrism generally and of sentientism is it doesn't go far enough. And actually the first, one of the earliest uses of the term sentientism was in a derogatory sense by a chap called John Rodman, who who criticised Singer's animal liberation and said it's a it's a sort of zoo-centric sentientism. And he was saying, look, it's just a discrimination. What about all those poor non-sentient things out there in the environment that clearly matter? And he was much more of a fan of a sort of a holistic or an ecocentric or um, even more than a biocentric view. But while I see non-sentient aspects of the environment, whether they're plants or rocks or rivers or mountains, as deeply important, the only reason they're important is because of the impact they have on the experiences of sentient beings. So that's why no one really cares about some dusty rock in the valley of you know, Mars, because you know who cares, right? Literally, there's no who to care about it either way. It is morally irrelevant. So, so I, I do find that challenge of, like you, I'm sort of nervous that I'm overconfident in that, but it does feel almost tautological. Some people criticise tautologies, but tautologies are tautologies because they're right. So, um, you know, like it's, but another area where I think we might agree is that sentientism, I've, I've deliberately tried to reframe it in a way that is actually neutral about most of philosophy. So it just says we use naturalism to try and form provisional pro- probabilistic beliefs, and then we draw our moral circle based on sentience. But beyond that, it doesn't say anything explicitly about how you manage moral trade-offs or what your moral system is. So whereas Singer, of course, was much more explicitly utilitarian, one of the other people who developed the term sentientism originally, Richard Ryder, went on to refine something called painism, which actually focused much more on the on the pain and the negative side of suffering, which I guess links to sort of negative utilitarianism and some other schools of thought. But I've sort of tried to frame this version of sentientism as staying out of those fights and just saying, look, let's get lock, lock in naturalism, lock in all sentient beings included in our moral circle. That's hopefully a pluralistic platform that everyone can agree on, whether you're Peter Singer or Richard Ryder or you know Tom Regan or whoever else, right? And and we can and we can then go on and fight on all over all of the other stuff. Personally, my my sort of view on the philosophical system does tend towards some form of moderated consequentialism or some sort of utilitarian view. And I'm nervous. I almost make a similar move there, where you know I can recognise the value of virtue ethics and deontological rules, but only as long as they consistently deliver positive utility consequences <laughs> which sort of you know so it's that usual debate about you know the consequentialists claiming that everything's consequentialism and i sort of think it is but um no but again sentientism keeps that neutral and says you can you can be a sentientist virtue ethicist if you have a believe in a virtue about being kind to sentient beings but you just have to include all the sentient beings and you can have a deontological rule about trying to avoid causing harm to sentient beings but you've still got a moral circle that includes sentient beings. So despite my own sort of preferences that go beyond the basic definition of sentientism, I've tried to keep it neutral. Yeah, it makes sense. How would you feel about some of the edge cases like where it, almost like rather than being too narrow, those other value systems take the moral circle broad, more broadly? Um, for instance, you might think that certain entities that aren't sentient do have capabilities that you care about. So I'll go back to the autonomy one. Mm-hmm. You might think that, for example, there are artificial entities that, whilst not sentient, they are sufficiently capable that you think that that warrants some moral consideration. So this this topic I've been looking into on moral consideration of artificial entities, there are some kind of almost like surprising common and influential perspectives in this field of ethics. And I guess it's kind of because it's like an edge case of ethics, right? But one of the, the kind of key arguments is the social relational perspective which basically takes the view that this is outlined by people like David Gunkel and Mark Krakenberg, and they basically push the idea, and I'll probably summarise it terribly, because, as I say, it doesn't align too well with my own intuitions. What's going on in the inside of these entities is kind of irrelevant, and it, you, you should start with the premise of you, you make a judgment about what's morally relevant, and this is based partly on how people interact mm-hmm. with entities in practice yeah sure all those sentient entities are included but so are all these other things and that might lead to resources being really thinly spread and if we talk about far future scenarios where there are far larger proportions of both sentient beings potentially and other entities like these we could think of autonomous artificial agents then that might lead to almost like catastrophically 
spread resources more thinly than than you would you would want and that well at least you would want from my consequentialist <laughs> sentience as the as the key consideration so i don't know do you have any thoughts on what well, yeah and I've, I've had some fascinating conversations with those guys on twitter actually and um i'm going to be interviewing someone who i think takes a similar sort of line josh gellers is i'm going to be interviewing him soon um although he takes what he describes as more of a hybrid approach that tries to take the best of relational worlds and some of the characteristic stuff and other things. And I, I do take some value from their approach, and I think it's it's well motivated. So I think some of their motivation is they're very nervous about using a characteristic for moral considerability, partly because they're worried that humans, particularly powerful humans, will pick the characteristic in a way that is self-serving or enables oppression of others. Or So they're nervous about that sort of universalist scientific approach of saying here's a characteristic that qualifies and anything outside doesn't qualify so they're worried about the negative or potentially oppressive implications of that and i appreciate that motivation i think the thinking about relational value is really important because most sentient beings are you know we have relationships and those relationships have enormous meaning and have a direct impact on the quality of our sentient experience so again i don't think the relations have value in their own right but they're really richly important if you want to understand the cause and effect and the impact on you know the quality of suffering and flourishing of sentient beings so i take some value from the relational side but again it's instrumental rather than intrinsic and my nervousness is that while i'm reasonably open-minded you know in a way sentientism says we have to include all sentient beings in your moral circle i'm reasonably open-minded if people want to think beyond that if they feel there's a justification for doing so as long as you what your your system then doesn't lead us to exclude any of those sentient beings from moral consideration. And that's what I'm really nervous about with the more relational approaches, because while they're motivated by a will of, you know, avoiding oppression by the powerful, that's one of the motives. To my mind, a relational approach actually enables that because the relational approach ends up categorizing sentient beings based on relations and categories that by definition are determined by the people with the power and the ability to speak in defining those relations and in the negotiations and the power systems that determine moral considerability. So there's a real risk of relational approaches, I think, that they can arbitrarily exclude sentient beings from moral consideration. So while I think people in that field, and again, there's a real danger of misrepresenting, that they're trying to resist forms of oppression, I think there's a real danger in relational approaches of opening up somewhat arbitrary categorizations defined by the powerful that enable them to then oppress those that weren't even able to be involved in the negotiation, if that makes sense. Whereas to my mind, of course, there's a risk that, you know, we we use sentience as a characteristic because of our own personal human experience of sentience. So there's a danger we're projecting that onto others and we need to be careful about that. But at the same time, using sentience as a characteristic is deliberately trying to break that anthropocentrism and saying, look, sentience is a characteristic that we're highly confident exists way beyond humans, existed way before humans, many, many millions of years before humans. It's a characteristic that is, you know, predates humans and is not banned by humans. And that if we're including in our moral circle of concern all beings that are capable of suffering, that's a buttress and a defense against oppression. Whereas relational approaches you know, open it up, right? And we've seen that even in human history where powerful groups have used a relational construct to de- arbitrarily define groups of other humans that are then removed from moral consideration. Whereas a sentientist approach, you know, just as a properly humanist approach would ha- act as a bulwark against oppression of all humans, a sentientist approach would act as a buttress against all oppression or all, all suffering. Yeah, that's a bit of a rant, but that's 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 how I take value from that relational approach. But ultimately... You know, it still comes back to sentience for me. Yeah, I think the problem is it's always going to essentially depend on whatever you think as being yeah. the inherently valuable stuff. And anything that doesn't prioritise that, even if it includes it to some extent, but includes other criteria as relevant, it's always going to be not the optimal <laughs> kind yeah. of treatment of those entities. And it is just a, a wide possible spectrum of the extent to which you think things are or aren't being excluded um, or are or aren't being kind of given the appropriate degree of moral consideration. Yeah. For example, if you take the, the some of the social relational things and there might be overlap, right? There might be artificial entities that we would say are sentient and that some social relational thinkers also value because of their interactions. There might be overlap and almost like exactly yeah. 
it's some context. But at other instances, there might be almost like a total disregard of one group of entities that the that the other sort of group of thinkers would think is yeah. super important to consider. Going back to Brantomasic and the work by Centre on Long-Term Risk, some of the artificial entities that they're most concerned about are essentially fairly uh, almost like strange and obscure seeming types of artificial entities that look nothing like humans. They might be programs or subroutines or simulations within mm. A wider computer and this is not going to be in any way recognizable <laughs> as like human or human inspired or whatever it's not going to probably not going to interact with humans or human descendants or whatever or could you know there's obviously many possible futures but yeah. in, in some of these you can see how some of these entities essentially a social social relational thinker might assign them no moral consideration whereas a you know utilitarian might be extremely concerned about their well-being and vice versa there might be like robots essentially that are humans to all intents and purposes but completely nothing behind going on underneath, yeah yeah underneath the you know the in the head um no kind of sentience whatsoever where we would be although we wouldn't go out of our way to like kick such a robot you might think that there was essentially nothing morally wrong with abusing it uh yeah. whereas social relational thinker might be view that as morally abhorrent the really important subtext there which is is i guess m just moral and epistemological uncertainty Right, so, yeah. so we're talking about something that's supremely important, in fact, almost in, uniquely important in our moral thinking. So we need to be very careful and, and cautious about it. And I think that applies both in you know, the ethical system we use. So I think it's, it's really useful to think about the conclusions of different ethical systems and well, maybe we should be more careful or maybe we should be more prudent or we should be more hesitant. I think that's a really useful check to do at the same time as not allowing those systems to undermine the basic defense of, you know, anything we, we have confidence that is sentient does deserve moral considerability. But I think it also relates to the other topic you touch on, which is what is sentience and what things are sentient, what entities are sentient. And, and that's another, you know, one of the good things I, I like about this conception of sentientism is it cops out of all of the difficult stuff because it doesn't even include a definition of what beings are sentient. It just says, follow the science, more research required, but be have provisional probabilistic beliefs and be prudent as well you know so if you're not sure if something's sentient but you think it might be let's give it the benefit of the doubt and my, my personal view about sentience i guess also by extension consciousness is that it really is just a, a class of information processing that happens to evolve in us and many other non-human animals as really a way of, of an advanced modeling of the self as an entity in the environment and that evolved because it was useful for our you know, continued existence as patterns of information processing. So I think it, I, I think of it, it's, it's rich and it's powerful and might have varieties of experience that we can't even conceive of now, but in simple terms, that's what it is, just patterns of information processing. But there are other sentientists who have, you know, have a different view and a more expansive view of what sentience might be. Some will find my sort of quite hard-edged materialistic approach, they will say it's missing something, it's still missing that subjective qualia of experience. And I'm saying, no, Experience is just what it feels like to run this class of information process. It's very interesting, both when you're thinking about, you know, the very simplest animals, for example. You know, sea cucumber doesn't have a nervous system at all, so I have a high level of confidence it isn't sentient. But other people will push that definition, you know, a lot a long way, right, to learning agents or to photons and electrons. If you want to get into some forms of panpsychism, some of your work is fascinating as well because it's it's you're also thinking about artificial sentience. So, you know, my conception of sentience as a class of information processing, I think that can be substrate independent. I see no reason why that couldn't run on some other substrate. Um, but I also think based on the fact that the way I tend to infer sentience comes from a shared evolutionary past or at least some sort of evolutionary or design motivation to want to do advanced modeling of the self and the environment. It comes from, I guess, you know, behavior and observation and, and so on where you could might be able to infer sentience. And it comes from, I guess, architecture, you know, put someone in an fMRI scanner or you look at the firing of patterns or you try and infer from that that there are, there are analogs. And there are risks to all of those three ways of inferring sentience. You could still miss some, but those modes of inference make me much more skeptical about, you know, whether is the United States conscious or is an electron sentient or, you know, a learning agent in an AI system sentient. I'm, I'm more skeptical of those things. And I've, I've sort of teased some of the panpsychists by referring to PowerPointism as an alternative philosophy, where we say, look, if you look at the code of PowerPoint, you can't see, you can't experience the full glory of snap to grid and a line left and, um, you know, and slideshows and all the wonderful things, you know, the, the real the qualia of PowerPoint.
Um, so there must be some essence of each line of code, which has an essence of PowerPoint in it that maybe is the foundation of all physics. And that's not an entirely fair comparison, given the nature of PowerPoint versus the nature of our conscious experience. But it feels like there's some sort of analogy there that just because we don't yet understand how these things link, people are you know, almost redefining consciousness to such a degree that it just means all information processing and therefore almost everything. Yeah, so I tend to be a little bit more, maybe more traditional in my view of the likely fuzzy boundaries of sentience at this point. But I don't see any reason why conceptually uh, artificial or alien entities couldn't be sentient too. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty kind of agnostic about a lot of the kind of consciousness theory stuff. I, well, one, I just get quite confused over it and it's definitely not <laughs> something I feel I can contribute very much to. Um, yeah this idea of like almost like you said at the start of not kind of sentientism not needing to define sentience per se assuming there's something somewhere in that ballpark <laughs> yeah. that matters what do we do about it is kind of the approach that i tended to take um, and defer the the hard thinking about that to, to others who feel more confident on it my colleague jc has got a paper seeking to get published which is kind of ex expanding on his view a little bit we do have a, a blog post on our website i think it's just called what is sentience or something like that should, mm. should be fairly easy to find, which is kind of basically just Jason going to his his views on it. But as he says in the post, we haven't kind of committed Sentience Institute to any kind of definition or anything yeah. like that. And, and that brings us nicely to the final section of the conversation, really, about which is about the future. So this is about, you know, imagining we can persuade more of the 8 billion people on the planet to use evidence and reason in forming their beliefs and that we can in, persuade them to broaden their moral circle to at least include you know, the beings that are obviously sentient now, what that future might look like and how we might get there. And we can operate across a bunch of different timescales. And it might be interesting in that context to layer in quick intro for people who are watching and listening to this that don't know of, of I guess, the field of effective altruism which is, in a way, taking some of the implications of a sentientist worldview, you know, it's sort of scientific and evidence-based, and it has a generally a broad moral circle, but it is then saying, okay, based on that, there's an implication we should try and do the most good, and we should do that using evidence and reason to work out how to do the most good. So it'd be interesting to layer in your view of how effective altruism fits in, but then, yeah, talk about how can we make this future happen up whether it's by mm. you know expanding the moral circle and addressing some of those deep challenges of social change that uh, the sentience institute focuses on and you're trying to help address with aac as well yeah to kind of give the context on the effective altruism community well effective altruism is lots of different things at the same time really it's a mindset it's a set of principles which as you say are, are, are quite similar to ones you've been outlining already a kind of commitment to scientific values and an approach to using those in order to do good in the world and do the most good you can do maximizing mm -hmm. that it's it's that it's also a kind of a research question like how can we do the most good and it's also a community of people who are you know focusing on these questions mm. and Census Institute, I guess, draws on all of those things at the same time in the sense of, you know, we are a research organization, we're committed to those principles, and we certainly cite and take influence from some of the other research that other organizations in the space have been doing. What is it that we're that we're looking for, I guess, trying to trying to achieve? Yeah, certainly this world where different sentient beings are sufficiently included in in the moral circle. And you mentioned thinking about different timescales. We're certainly kind of thinking in terms of maximizing our positive impact on the real long run future this kind of implies that there is no or not very much difference between an entity existing in 10 years or an entity existing in 1000 and 1 million and so on it's and, quite a mind-bending concept <laughs> yeah kind of maximize the positive well-being and minimize the negative experience of those of, of all sentient beings basically and we can think in terms of uh, i guess when I think in the moral circle, I think in terms of the beings and the reasons that certain beings are excluded or neglected. And we've kind of touched on some of these and the time the time thing plays in here in the sense that one kind of axis is time, right? People tend to look at on fairly short term time horizons. We tend to prioritize what affects us or the near future or maybe our children or something like that. Mm. Um, and so the interests of future beings are quite often neglected. And this is an area, certainly a, a topic of interest of many individuals in the effective altruism community, there's the term long termism has been coined, which is essentially the idea that the main determinant of the value of your actions is the effects of those actions on the long term future. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is that because of the kind of the vast scale of the future, that's what matters the most, basically. Um, so yeah, there's that axis of 
of future. There's an axis of substrate, which we've talked about so far, which could be, you know, silicon versus carbon or whatever. It could be humans versus artificial. There's species, and this could be human compared to animals, but it can also potentially be different animals compared to each other. You might think, for example, of companion yeah. animals compared to farmed animals and how despite comparable levels of sentience and other things we might potentially care about, certain species are relatively excluded. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different things that we could kind of go on down that line of where there are, mm. another one could be like is geographical distance, for example, and this is again something that the effective altruism community is, is focused on to some extent with its interest in kind of addressing global poverty and stuff like that, where quite often people, I'm sure people are familiar with the phrase charity begins at home and stuff like that, where people yeah. prioritize looking after geographically nearest, even if not kind of you know, even if many other things are exactly the same between different beings, people kind of just focus on what's nearest to them. So, yeah, we can kind of think in terms of all these different axes. And I guess the, the ideal world that we're striving for is one where these axes do not prevent certain yeah. beings from being accorded the moral consideration that they need and that they need just as much as as some other kind of the correct and equivalent amount or whatever is the correct phrasing, I guess. I do find the long termism story interesting but i'm probably guilty of a what's i think called a sort of presentist <laughs> bias and, I, and it's more of an intuition than something i've worked through is that the best way of securing a really good long-term future for all sentient beings is to free human mental and emotional capacity from the bottom end of maslow's hierarchy so that we can bring our human capabilities to bear to lock in that long-term future so that sort of draws me back to some of the more you know immediate causes around global poverty and global development and um uh, as well as the moral circle expansion in the short term around animal, you know, ending animal farming and as well as existential risks. Because I think part of the reason some people are hesitant about the long term future is because of the uncertainty about whether those entities will ever exist. But again, you know, much of the long term stuff is sort of intellectually beyond me. So I'll just watch and read with interest. Um, but another thing that would be fascinating to come back to, you, you've described the Sentience Institute and I guess your work with animal advocacy careers as well as focused on this topic of social change. And that has been fascinating throughout all of these conversations, both on this sort of naturalistic versus supernatural epistemology and broadening the moral circle, because we're in this odd position. And most of the people who've had these conversations with me are in this odd position where naturalism and sentiocentrism seem somewhat self-evident and really sort of locked in and obvious but most of the people on the planet disagree with us and that largely is a social change phenomenon it's because most people on the planet are taught from birth you know frankly a set of fabrications and um, or you know or that it's okay to believe things for which there's no good evidence so they're taught a non-naturalistic worldview and they're certainly taught a much narrow moral circle and often it isn't a circle at all it's some sort of odd shape of you know, family, friends, nation, state, maybe race, maybe gender, maybe caste, uh, maybe some companion animals and charismatic wild animals, but no wild animals and certainly no farm animals. You know, so it's a god awful mishmash that is very much defined by the social norms, not by an intellectual or a process of ethical exploration. And I'm tempted by the very naive view that all we need to make the world a better place is really crystal clear ethical and intellectual arguments. And then the lights will go on. But I mean, we just know that's not the case. What's your philosophy, and I guess SI's philosophy and AAC's philosophy about how we can actually fight against what feels sometimes like a dead weight of social norms that are getting in the way of doing, to me, some really obviously good things? Almost the, the whole purpose, or at least the focus of our work, has been kind of addressing this question of how yeah. we can most effectively encourage social change. And that's kind of including both behavior and attitudinal stuff and those two factors. Uh, definitely interacting yeah so I, uh, I don't really know the best way to answer that question but I guess I could kind of talk as an example about some of the stuff that Census Institute has, has looked at and some of the conclusions we've come to I think one of the the most like key findings and kind of strongest positions that we've developed a relatively strong view on is the idea that at least within the animal advocacy movement institutional tactics have been neglected relative to individual tactics. Yeah. And what I mean by this is that individual tactics, it, it tends to focus on encouraging individuals to change their behavior, specifically their diet. There's been this, obviously, when you think of animal advocacy or you think of veganism, whatever, you think of people encouraging people to go vegan, basically, and say, yeah. do this, go vegan, uh, you help the animals, help the planet, help health, whatever. So there's been this big focus on that. They don't use exactly the same definitions, but there's some research by the group Animal Charity Evaluators that looks at the 
proportion of resources that animal advocacy nonprofits have devoted to individual tactics relative to other tactics types. It's over half, if I recall correctly, basically it focused on individual compared to some other categories that mm. partly overlap with what we're using. It's a large proportion of resources in any case. And yeah, so we've basically, we basically argued that institutional tactics have been neglected. And by that, we mean targeting companies, governments, uh, and potentially social norms more broadly. And to some extent, we also include within that tactics that are in, in are focused on smoothing the transition to away from animal products. So that could include, for example, new technologies and new foods that are intended to make it easier to transition, like plant-based foods or yeah. cultivated meat, which is animal products grown from animal cells, but without requiring the sort of animals. So yeah, to kind of outline uh, some of the, the types of evidence we've come across that have pushed us in this direction, we do a lot of looking at past social movements and historical evidence and kind of work out what's worked for some movements and what hasn't worked and that sort of thing. And so it's a fairly consistent thing that although several movements have used a mixture of these things, often some of their most notable successes are with their institutional tactics. You could also just look at and kind of categorize them and go, which seem to have mostly succeeded, mostly failed, and which sorts of tactics did they rely on, that sort mm. of thing. Some of the most notable and successful movements have relied substantially on these kind of institutional tactics, examples being, you know, obviously this is a bit of a simplification, but uh, the British anti-slavery movement relied mostly on these kind of institutional campaigns. It was primarily a political movement. They did have this kind of boycott of sugar, but it was specifically slave-made sugar uh, and only sugar, it wasn't kind of all slave made goods. And it was yeah. built towards this particular political campaign. It was about building support for that campaign. And obviously, as we know, slavery was abolished in slave trade and then slavery as an institution was abolished in the in the UK as one of, if not the first nations doing this. In, in America, by comparison, there was very much a focus, at least initially, on individual consumption and the free produce movement which was essentially boycott all slave made goods you must be you must go and buy these goods that are more expensive but not made by slaves yeah. um, and it was a tiny tiny number of people and it never really took off basically and essentially the the abolitionists in america kind of gave up on this tactic and switched to more political tactics and and, and, and other methods yeah i was just going to say that i guess there are a bunch of other movements where we could we could look at this this sort of thing an example might be well, I guess this is kind of more of an example of some of the the kind of where it, tactics seem to have succeeded or failed type thing. But I've, I've done a report on the anti-abortion movement in the US, for example, which mm. although I might disagree with because they're not using sentience as the key criteria, they are kind of, to some extent, advocating for an expansion of the moral circle to include an entity that's being excluded as human fetuses. Yeah. Um, and so they have essentially struggled to kind of basically attitudes to abortion have stayed pretty much constant um, for decades in terms of support for the kind of the big ultimate goals that the respective movements are pushing for. And yet the anti-abortion movement has managed to win a bunch of institutional reforms pushing in the direction that they're interested in, increasing restrictions in a lot of states on freedom to have emotions basically and stuff like yeah. that through an institutional approach again there's always a tendency for these debates to get a bit tribal so the people who are pushing the go vegan message feel like they're fighting against the people who are pushing the institutional message and and i don't think that's what your sensitive institute are suggesting at all it's it's just you know changing the balance because mm -hmm. i think individual actions absolutely do make a difference you know every you know, marketing impulse you pull out of the system does r reduce the likelihood to have a small that, you know, there will be more suffering and, and death and more forced breeding. So I think it's a, it's a question of both, but I'd agree with your sense. And I, you know, I love your research that suggests that you can have even more bang for your buck and even more power if you, if you work on those institutional levers. And I think the other point is that this doesn't mean that individuals get to sit back and sort of wait for institutional change to happen because those institutions are made up of and driven by individuals. Just as we are all consumers, we are all also voters and employees and shareholders and governors and stakeholders. And so I think it's not a disempowering message about individuals, you know, sitting back and not making a change in their own lives. It's about how those individuals can actually affect the change they want to see in the world, you know, as well as just changing their own personal choices. So I find it's quite an empowering message as well. And it, and it helps, yeah, you know, really. hopefully get people more engaged with where the levers of power really are in their society rather than sort of abdicating responsibility and sitting back. So Yeah, this is certainly not meant to imply that individuals can't do anything. Uh, potentially yeah. the, the wording, obviously these, these phrases are open to 
multiple definitions and stuff like that. It's essentially about the ask that you're making of individuals. There's also a kind of overlapping consideration about the messaging used to encourage individuals to make their change. What I was talking about before was mostly about essentially the ask we're making of people. And so it might be that rather than the ask being change your diet, it might be, for example, we ask them to sign a petition or join a protest and essentially mobilize and that sort of thing. It can also be that this is also partly about just like how we use the resources that are available to us as a movement. It's about do we focus on asking individuals to do those things or do we focus on just like some of our time is just like pressuring companies and governments like with our time, for example, it could be that, you know, it might be a vote in favor of, say, lobbying over leafleting or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, as individuals, we can think of, I guess this is this is where kind of my work in animal advocacy careers plays in is you can think about how you can use your time. You can think about how you can use your, your money and your resources. And so with money, you might think, oh, if you're more optimistic about institutional tactics relative to individual, you would donate to just different charities to what you'd otherwise do because... Yeah they're prioritizing different tactics. But you could also think as an individual, where do I focus my career? Again, it might just mean that you work for a different charity or you volunteer for a different charity or whatever. But it might also mean that you think, hey, let's go let's go work in policy. Let's go work in politics. Let's go work in a food company. Let's go work in something else like that, uh, where these different, or academia or whatever, where these different options, the kind of end outcome is obviously what you're hoping for is the same, but the next step you're taking, the kind of the message yeah. you're you're making or what you're asking of people is is different and this is an unfair question to ask because so much depends on the context and the individual and their skills and their preferences but what are your sort of top bets for the most impactful animal advocacy careers at the moment what sort of fields do you think are the places where someone could really make a big difference yeah i mean I, you're right that it depends on a whole host of factors so just to give yeah. a response answer i'll start with <laughs> i'll start with the caveat and then i'll answer, give a more direct answer where i think it depends on a bunch of kind of career strategy considerations and so this might be the the impact potential of different role types which is kind of mostly what you're getting at there i think but just to say that that is not the the only consideration right you might think that you have strong personal fit with some roles over others and that you can kind of excel in something else and that might count for more you might also think not just what your personal fit is but how you compare to other individuals in the community and in the movement who might plausibly work in different areas and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also a bunch of just kind of like things like building your career capital your credentials and your connections and your skills to enable you to excel in later roles and keeping options open all these different kind of considerations so (laughs) <laughs> there's no there's no kind of like everybody should go do this. So it's important to say that kind of whatever I say next doesn't mean that like you should drop what you're doing. Yeah, you should get in touch with animal advocacy careers and do it properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Or or think about it carefully and kind of map out your options and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, well, I guess so we have recently done a survey of animal advocacy nonprofits and we've done another survey of kind of researchers you know, comparable to my role at Centers Institute, people who are thinking at a kind of movement level about what's what's most important. And we asked them how they would kind of encourage people. So the, uh, just to give the list of kind of options that I gave people in terms of how I think about the different kind of categories of careers that you could have. I think we gave people animal advocacy nonprofits, like working for existing ones, setting up new animal advocacy nonprofits, working in food companies. So this would be companies making like animal product alternatives. So plant-based meat, cultivated meat that I mentioned earlier, or setting up new ones. We also added in there academia, policy and politics, as in like the people kind of working on the inside of, of these institutions trying to change from the inside. We had a kind of category for related legal work, kind of like litigation in a law firm or something like that. I think I feel is, like that mis- is that pushing pushing forward, um, you know, legal arguments for personhood or challenging uh, animal agriculture practices, those types of interventions? Yeah, it could be either of those, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Several people commented saying that that category overlapped with the others, which it does, because you can yeah. do that work in non in nonprofits, or you could do it in a kind of a policy context. But oh, the other, yeah, the other key one is is this idea of earning to give, essentially focusing your career on earning as much money as you can so that you can donate it to effective animal advocacy nonprofits. Yeah. Or might not be animal advocacy, you, you know, the concept could apply to other cause areas as well. But in our case, we were talking about animal advocacy. Um, yeah, so I gave people this this list of different options, and I was asking how people would kind of divide up a kind of theoretical pool of quite talented individuals who are quite open to lots of different directions which is not you have a thousand people to deploy yeah exactly Exactly. that's that's the way i framed it and these respondents kind of put quite high for animal advocacy nonprofits. um you might think that's partly because for example the respondents themselves work in animal advocacy nonprofits, (laughs) uh, and there's a bunch of different limitations but yeah, I do think that plausibly there's a lot of good work to be done in animal advocacy nonprofits, um, including 
So I think I'm relatively more optimistic. I, I have c kind of ex comparing my answers to the average answers. I'm personally relatively more optimistic about all the options, all the other options compared to nonprofits. Not to say that nonprofit work isn't super important, but that some of the other options are also potentially really influential in different ways. I answered above average compared to the other respondents for academia, for working in these animal product alternatives companies and in policy and politics as well. So I, I do think there's like lots of different ways, kind of levers yeah. that you can pull to encourage social change. And it's just, it depends a lot on your personal fit and where you can contribute, excel the most. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I think you could, with every one of those examples, you can imagine a chain of possibilities for how you could you know, drive some really large scale change. And to close out, how optimistic do you feel about the, the potential pace of social change? And we've talked about long term future and we've talked about artificial sentience and, you know, there's the challenge of wild animal suffering and so on. But if we focus back on what, you know, what for many people is the, you know, the big beast of, of animal agriculture, it feels to many people like that we might, although everything always feels too slow, we might, you know, things might be starting to shift. What's your sense? Of how optimistic are you about seeing really radical change happen in the field of animal agriculture? Um, I'm very, very optimistic that it will happen. I guess it depends what timeframes you're talking on. Sometimes there seems to be disagreement on this, but actually there's only disagreement insofar as people, some people are talking about like 10 years and some people are talking about 100 years plus. I think it seems pretty unlikely to me that animal agriculture will persist indefinitely, partly because it's just an inefficient system as opposed to for the moral yeah. arguments. And essentially, this is extremely helpful in the sense that cultivated meat and other animal product alternatives, once developed, if we manage to overcome some of the kind of potential social and regulatory hurdles, which I think is a, which is a very important area of work and a quite a arguably slightly neglected compared to some other strategies that the animal advocacy movement is pursuing. It seems unlikely to me that animal agriculture will will persist, basically. I mean, it seems that if, if, if someone came to you now and said, I've invented a new food system where we take one type of food and we feed it through a process which destroys 90% of that food and turns it into shit and piss and causes catastrophic suffering and threatens the environment as well, what do you think? most people would, would probably not be that enthusiastic. So, you know, I share that sort of optimism that despite, you know, the inertia of social acceptability of how we do things now that, you know, the end has to be in sight. It's a question of how long, but uh, let's see. Yeah. I would add that I think it's also important that just because something is likely doesn't mean that working on it isn't important. Consumption of animal products and investment in this system is kind of hindering people's, yeah, preventing their moral consideration of farmed animals and animals in yeah. general in the sense that it, it forces this kind of cognitive dissonance, forces this kind of justification of of current attitudes. Um, yeah, it's like I'm waiting for clean meat to come through. So, <laughs> Yeah, there's a bunch of psychological experiments that basically show that people attribute less moral standing to farmed animals because they're farmed, or at least that's, that's one implication. Even though the end of animal farming seems likely to me on long enough time fr frames, it doesn't seem guaranteed it seems vital that we kind of maximise the probability that it is ended, even if we don't necessarily, sorry, minimise the time it takes before it's ended. I mean, obviously, that's also helpful and good in the sense you'd be saving millions or billions of lives and preventing animals from being bred into these like torturous conditions. But in terms of our effects on the long run future, what to me seems more important is ensuring that it is ended essentially that's been an absolutely fascinating wide-ranging conversation thank you jamie <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to sort of layer into the conversation before we wrap up it's nice to finish on a somewhat optimistic note about how much change we can drive i, I guess i'd kind of like to go through some just kind of list some of the different places that people go to if can go to if they're interested in like different yeah. parts of my work <laughs> that would be brilliant because you've done some fascinating work and work for some great organizations so yeah feel free to sort of point people at how they can follow you and learn more and i'll include everything in the the notes for the video and the podcast of course as well yeah so sentence institute I've, i was talking quite a lot earlier about this forthcoming paper we have on the moral consideration of artificial entities that's not out yet, so I can't link you to that, but hopefully it'll be soon. If you're interested in these kind of like more amorphous considerations about why we work on what we do. So I gave a talk specifically on that if you want to kind of sit back and listen introductory thing. But I think more useful is the kind of detailed blog post written by my colleague, JC, which is entitled Why I Prioritise Moral Circuit Expansion.
over artificial intelligence alignment and it's comparing it to another cause that you might plausibly work on if you care about the long-term future. Other than that, um, we obviously have these different research reports and most of it's building on these kind of key questions that I've been, that I've been talking about, like the institutional versus individual change. We have a kind of, if you're interested in the animal advocacy perspective, we have a we have a summary page on our website called the Foundational Questions in Effective Animal Advocacy, which basically lists a bunch of these different questions like institutional individual change, should we, which should we prioritize? That page, you know, can t- takes you to the kind of summaries on those things. And obviously people can dive into the individual reports if they're interested in some of the, the research we've done. I guess I also should also say, I kind of gave the impression earlier, all our work was historical research. It's not. We do a bunch of different things. We have surveys, we do experiments, we do literature reviews of external bodies of research, we do social movement case studies, we do tech adoption case studies, we do essentially whatever we think will help and give us. And you've done some great work on assessing the scale of factory farming and animal agriculture globally as well. So yeah, yeah, that was, uh, there's a couple of posts of their estimates of the numbers of animals currently in in factory farm conditions, as opposed to you more often see for estimates of number of slaughtered animals, which from a utilitarian perspective, at least isn't as relevant, because we more care about the number of beings suffering at any one point, basically. Uh, There's also the podcast I mentioned earlier, which I'm sure many people listening to this these conversations would be interested in as well, because there's, you know, as we mentioned, a lot of overlapping topics. And then animal advocacy careers, quite different work but our website you can go on there and see see what we offer uh, if you're listening to this fairly shortly after this is released i guess we will have a online course that will be application will be running from december until kind of mid-january time and it'd be great if people wanted to apply to that and just kind of go through some of the considerations that i was talking about earlier that's brilliant thank you and you on social media yourself do you partake much yeah i am excessively prolific on facebook <laughs> partly because <laughs> i administrate a group called effective animal advocacy discussion which is another great kind of starting resource for people if they want to kind of get involved with some of these kind of movement level considerations other than that i don't have like twitter or anything like that. like that i don't really i don't post but i do have a newsletter where i share a bunch of the kind of research that comes up and i see is important and also kind of link to our job board and animal advocacy careers and just kind of like different ways people can get engaged and stuff like that and that is my, my utilitarian kind of beliefs coming out very strongly here but it's called <laughs> but can they suffer um and yeah <laughs> i can bet them yeah yeah exactly a quote from jeremy bentham and yeah a link to a different kind of research that comes up comes out each month if you want to stay up to date on that well jamie it's been a real pleasure to talk to you thank you it's a fascinating and rich range of research you've done and it's inspirational to talk to someone who's so clearly focused on expanding our moral circle and making the world a better place so yeah thank you for the conversation it's been great to talk to you thank you and yeah you too and thanks for the work you're doing and also expanding the community of people interested in these in these topics and hopefully taking some some actions that help to advance the the causes we care about yeah i mean it's one of the two you know the only two things that sentientism cares about expanding the moral circle and you know taking a naturalistic approach to understanding reality so um we're highly aligned. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Good to speak to you. Yeah, you too, Jamie. Thanks.